Dracula by Bram Stoker. Επιμέλεια Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης. Mina Harker's Journal, September the 22nd. In the train to Exeter. Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between them, in Whitby, and all the world before me, Jonathan away, and no news of him. And now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich master of his business, Mr. Hawkins dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us. So it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise. Anyhow, the service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, one or two old friends from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and our dearest friend was now gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would be of interest for me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down, but there were very few people there, and it was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to do in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself somehow. But it was Jonathan and Jonathan was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl in a large cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me. He then said under his breath, My God! I am always anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out, as half in terror and half in amazement. He gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and black moustache and pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard and cruel and sensual, and his big white teeth, that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill, he looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was so disturbed. He answered, evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did, Do you not see who it is? No, dear, I said. I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as he did not know that it was to me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself. The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel, gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him, and said as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so, oh my God, my God, if I only knew if I only knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him questions, so I remained silent. I drew him away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further, 
and then went in and sat down for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed, and he went quietly into a sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him to do, so I did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, Why, Mina, have I been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this relapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him for fear I shall do more harm than good but I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time is come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan, still pale and dizzy, under a slight relapse of his malady, and now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra. Poor Lucy, gone, gone, never to return to us. And poor, poor Arthur, to have lost such sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 22nd. It is all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us. But he bore himself, though he were like a moral Viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes over to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow night. He only wants to make some arrangements, which can only be made personally. He is to stop with me then, if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow. I feel that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation where his blood had been transfused into Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had been really married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humour asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds lest anyone should see us and misjudge. Then he cried till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together, just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under such circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth, and why at such a time. His reply was, in a way, characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful and mysterious. He said, Ah, you don't comprehend, friend John. 
Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did shock me. But no more think that I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter, who knock at your door and say, May I come in? Is not true laughter? No, he is king, and he come when and how he like. He ask no person, he choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold, in example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn. I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my others suffer as want that she may have all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave. Laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop upon her coffin and say, Thud! Thud! I laugh to my heart till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy, so of the age of mine own boy had I been so blessed that he lived, and with his eyes and hair the same. There, you know now why I love him so. And yet when he say things that touch my husband heart to the quick, and make my father heart yearn to him as to no other man, not even to you, friend John, for we are more level in experiences than father and son, yet even at such a moment King laugh, he come to me and shout and bellow in my ear, Here I am, here I am, till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carried with him to my cheek. Oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world, a world full of miseries and woes and troubles, and yet when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play. Bleeding hearts, dry bones of the churchyard, and tears that burn as they fall, they all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of his. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come, and kind. Hmm, we men and women are like ropes drawn tight, with strain that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, until perhaps strain become too great, and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labor, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all. This so lovely lady, garlanded with flowers, that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where there so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her, and whom she loved. And that sacred bell, going tall, 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 so sad, so slow. And those holy men, with the white garments of the angel, pretending to read books, and yet all the time, their eyes never on the page, and all of us with the bowed head. And all for what? She is dead. So, is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said, I can't see anything to laugh at in all that. Your explanation makes a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service were comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so. But there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Oh, oh. Then this so sweet maid is a polyandrist, 
And me, with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits, all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to this now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feeling to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my very heart then when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have packed up his crown and all that is to him, for he go far, far away from me, and for long, long time, maybe you would pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone, and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day, Loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or if I ever open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here at the end, where the romance of my life is told, ere I go back to take up the thread of my life's work, I say sadly and without hope, finish. The Westminster Gazette, September the 25th. A Hampstead Mystery. The neighbourhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves but the consensus of their excuses is that they have been with a bloofer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighbourhood that as the first child missed, gave as his reason for being away, that a bloofer lady had asked him to come for a walk, the others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural, as the favourite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be a bloofer lady is supremely funny. Some of our caricaturists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesques by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the bloofer lady should be the popular role at these al fresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question. For some of the children, indeed all who have been missed, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around the Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, September the 25th. Extra Special. The Hampstead Horror. Another child injured. The Bloofer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hillside of Hampstead Heath, 
which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wounds in the throat as has been noticed in the other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bluefer lady. Mina Harker's Journal, September the 23rd. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he has said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal and lock myself in my room and read it. September the 24th. I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. The poor dear, how he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever and then write those terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet the man we saw yesterday, he seemed quite certain of him. Poor fellow, I suppose it was the funeral that upset him so and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane. There seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful count was coming to London with its teeming millions. There may be a solemn duty, and if it comes, we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes, if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps, if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be so upset, for I can speak for him and never let him be troubled or worried with it at all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all. Then I can ask him questions and find out things to see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, 24th September. Confidence. Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far friend as that I send to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westerner's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you which show how great friends you were and how you love her. O oh, Madame Mina, by that love I implore you, help me. It is for others' good that I ask, to redress great wrong and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you. You can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and I know how good you are and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again your pardon, and forgive me. Van Helsing Telegram, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing September the 25th Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker Mina Harker's Journal, September the 25th 
I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience, and as he has attended poor Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason for his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking, not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real truth now. How silly I am. That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it is only about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it. And now he wants to tell me about it, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on dear poor Lucy. I do hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear any more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, clears the air as the rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is now two o'clock, and the doctor will be here soon. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal so that in case he asks about Lucy, I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. The doctor has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting! And how it all makes my head whirl round. I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible? Or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even a possibility. Poor, poor dear Jonathan, how he must have suffered. Please the good God, all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it, but it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man, as well as a clever one, if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's, and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good, he is kind, and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow, I shall ask him about Jonathan, and then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing, Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory was everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Well, here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage in my hands and waited. In a few minutes Mary opened the door and announced Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me, a man of medium height, strongly built, with his shoulder set back over a broad, deep chest, and a neck well balanced on the trunk as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes one at once as indicative of the thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard, square chin, a large, resolute mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big bushy eyebrows come down and the mouth tightens. 
The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight, then sloping back above two bumps of ridges wide apart. Such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but it falls naturally back to the sides. Big, dark blue eyes are set widely apart, and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, Mrs. Harker, is it not? I bowed assent. That was Miss Mina Murray? Again I assented. It is Mina Murray that I came to see that was the friend of that poor dear child, Lucy Westenra. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and a helper of Lucy Westenra. And I held out my hand, he took it, and then said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I knew that the friend of that poor lily girl must be good, but I had yet to learn. He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you left, and was made in imitation of you. And in that diary she traces by interference certain things to a sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you and ask you out of your so much kindness to tell me all of it that you remember. I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it. Ah, then you have a good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. No, Doctor, but I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, my dear Madam Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favour. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some of the taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths. So I handed him the shorthand diary. He then took it with a grateful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish, I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for the instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you so clever woman, he said. I long knew that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness. But see, his wife have all the good things. And will you not so much honour me as to help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed. So I took the typewritten copy from my work basket and handed it to him. Forgive me, I said. I could not help it. But I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it, and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said. May I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read. Oh, by all means, I said. Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat. He bowed and settled himself into a chair with his back to the light, and became absorbed in the papers while I went to see after lunch, chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madame Mina, he said, how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opened the gate to me. I am dazed. I am dazzled with so much light. And yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you cannot comprehend. 
Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman. Madam, he said very solemnly, if ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be a pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend. As a friend? But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will have a happy life, and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. But, doctor, I said, you praise me too much, and, and you do not know me. Not know you? I, who am old, and who have studied all my life men and women, I, who have made my speciality the brain, and all that belongs to him, and all that follows from him, and I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, not know you? Oh, Madame Mina, good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute, such things that angels can read. And we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust. And trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him, is he quite well? Is all that fever gone, and he is strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan. So I said, He has almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. He then interrupted, Oh, yes, yes, I know, I know, I have read your last two letters. I then went on. I suppose this upset him, for when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock. A shock? And after brain fever so soon? That was not good. What kind of shock was it? He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. At this point, the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. The pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me ever since. All came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands, raised me up, made me sit on the sofa and sat by me. He held my hand in his and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, My life, my dear, is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned to hear by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope. Hope not in what... I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy. Good women whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be here of some use to you. For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly, and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps overanxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he liked not where he loved is not to his good. Therefore, for his sake, you must eat and smile. 
You have told me all about Lucy, and now we shall not speak of it, lest in distress. I shall stay in Exeter to-night, for I want to think over what you have told me, and when I have thought, I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble so far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards you shall tell me all. After lunch we went back to the drawing-room. He said to me, And now, tell me all about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear he would think me a weak fool, and to think Jonathan a madman. The journal is also strange, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish, that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner, as well as by his words, when he said, Oh, my dear, if you only knew how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of anyone's belief, no matter how strange it be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read for yourself and judge. And then when I see you, perhaps, you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said. I then gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, so soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us, and see him then. You could catch the quick 3.34 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains offhand, but did not know that I had made up all the trains to and from Exeter so that I could help Jonathan in case he was in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away, and I sit here thinking. Th Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker, September the 25th, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is noble fellow. And let me tell you from experience of men that one who would do as he did in going down that wall and to that room, I and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear before I have even seen him. So be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much. And again I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours, the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Letter. Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing, September the 25th, 6.30 p.m. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, 
A thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet, if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London. I fear to think. I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan saying that he leaves by the 6.25 tonight from Lawsiston and will be here at 10.18, so I shall have no fear tonight. Will you therefore, instead of lunching with us, please to come to breakfast at 8 o'clock, if this be not too early for you? You can get away, if you are in a hurry, by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it, that if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal, September the 26th I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visits, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she had been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark and distrustful. But now that I know, I am not afraid even of the Count. He has succeeded after all then in his design of getting to London, and it was he I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it all over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder, turned my face round to the light, and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill. I have had a shock but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you are a physiognomist. Hmm, I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast. And oh, my dear sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age so sceptical, so selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Lucy, and some of them speak of you. So I know you since some days from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. 
Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look, my dear sir, I said, does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you can take them with you and read the papers. After breakfast, I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send to you and take Madame Mina too? We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got in the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and whilst we were talking in the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eye suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them, the Westminster Gazette, I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself, Mein Gott, oh mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at that moment. Just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself, and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, A love to Madame Mina. I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 26th. Truly, there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said finish, and yet here I am starting fresh again, or rather going on with the same record. Until this afternoon, I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become to all intents as sane as ever he was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and had just started in the spider line also, so he had not been any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur written on Sunday, and from it I gather he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy. So as to them, all my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming citrusized. Everything is, however, now reopened. And what is to be the end, God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to whet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into my room about half past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? He asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant. But he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small punctured wounds on their throats. An idea struck me, and I looked up. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, I said. I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, my friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? 
not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me, of nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood, and how the blood lost or waste. I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me, and went on, You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, and your wit is bold. But you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear. And that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are? That some people see things that others cannot? But there are things old and new which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Hmm. It is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs, which think themselves new, and which are yet but the old, which pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference. No? Nor in materialization? No? Nor in astral bodies? No. Nor in the reading of thought? No? Nor in hypnotism? Yes, I said. Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Ah, then you are satisfied as to it. Yes, and of course then you understand how it acts and can follow the mind of the great Charcot. Alas, that he is no more. You follow him into the very soul of the patient that he influence. No? Then, my friend John, Am I to take it that you simply accept facts and are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank? No? Then tell me, for I am student of the brain, how you accept the hypnotism and yet reject the thought reading. Let me tell you, my friend, that there are things today done in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived nine hundred years, and old Pa one hundred and sixty-nine, and yet that poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day. For had she lived one more day, we could have saved her. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? Do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy, and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men, not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die, small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church, and grew and grew, till on descending he could drink the oil of all the church lamps? Can you tell me why in the pampas, I and elsewhere, there are bats that come at night, and open the veins of cattle and horses, and suck dry their veins? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day that those who have seen describe like giant nuts or pods, and that when the sailors sleep on the deck because that it is hot, flit down on them, and then, then in the morning are found dead men, white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the nineteenth century?" He waved his hand for silence, and then went on. Can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men? Why the elephant goes on and on till he has seen the dynasties? And why the parrot never die only of bite of cat or dog, or other complaint? 
Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are some few who live on all ways, if they be permit, that there are men and women who cannot die? We all know, because science has vouched for the fact, that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself to die, have been buried, his grave sealed and corn sowed on it, the corn reaped, be cut down, sown, reaped, cut again, and then men come take away the unbroken seal, and there lie the Indian fakir, not dead, but that rise up, walk amongst them as before. At this point I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in his study at Amsterdam. But he used then to tell me the thing so that I could have the object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without his help, yet I wanted to follow him, so I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present I am going in my mind from point to point as a madman and not a sane one follows an idea. I feel like a novice blundering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another in the mere blind effort to move on without knowing where I am going. That is a good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith that which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind, not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. We get the small truth first. Good! We keep him and we value him. But all the same, we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction injure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson aright? Ah, he was still my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think then that those so small holes in the children's throat were made by the same who made the hole in Miss Lucy. I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so. But alas, no. It is worse. Far, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair, placed his elbows on the table, and covered his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. For a while sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had during her life struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard and rose up as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why think you did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell you so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you? and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted, now so late, revenge for that time when you saved my life and from a fearful death? Ah, no. 
Forgive me, said I. He then went on. My friend, it was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know that you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet, I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed to know of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. There you come with me. This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category jealousy and proved the very truth he most abhorred. Van Helsing saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty fog. If it be not true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will do not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet very dread should help my cause, for it is in some need of belief. Now come, I tell you what I propose. First that we go off now, see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is friend of mine, and I think of yours, since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case, if he will not two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then... And then what? I said. He took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so I plucked up what heart I could and said that we had better hasten as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had been asleep and taken some food, and altogether was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat. They were smaller, and the edges looked fresher, that was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied it must have been the bite of some animal, perhaps a rat. But for his own part, he was inclined to think it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home, and it managed to escape, or even from the zoological gardens, a young one may have got loose, or been bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out, and was, I believe, traced in this direction. For a week after, the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath, and in every alley in the place, until this bluefer lady scare came along, since when it has been quite a gala time for them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the bluefer lady. I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home, you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. These fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Certainly not, not for a week at least, longer if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is no hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat. Then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's castle, along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock we started from the inn. It was then very dark, 
and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater once we were outside of their individual radius. The professor had evidently noticed the road we were to go, for he went on unhesitatingly, but as for me, I was quite in a mix-up as to locality. As we went further, we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us, we found the western tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back politely but quite unconsciously, motioned me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly and cautiously drew the door to, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one. In the latter case, we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. The tomb in the daytime, and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough. But now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust, their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance, when time discoloured stone and dust encrusted mortar and rusty dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle, the effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed irresistibly the idea that life, animal life, was not the only thing which could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal, he made assurance of Lucy's coffin. Another search in his bag, and he took out a turnscrew. What are you going to do? I asked. To open the coffin? You shall yet be convinced. Straightway he began taking out the screws, and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to me as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living. I actually took hold of his hand to stop him. He only said, You shall see. And again, fumbling in his bag, took out a tiny fret saw. Striking the turn screw through the lead with a swift downward stab which made me wince, he made a small hole which was, however, big enough to omit the point of the saw. I had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse. We doctors who have to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things, and I drew back towards the door. But the professor never stopped for a moment. He saw down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, then across, then down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it backwards towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, motioned me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. The fact that the coffin was empty was certainly a surprise to me and gave me a considerable shock. But Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground and so emboldened to proceed in his task. Are you satisfied now, friend John? he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as I answered him, I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, as far as it goes. But how do you, how can you account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. 
I felt that I was speaking folly, and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things and placed them in the bag, blew out the light and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us he closed the door and then locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed, not a very cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I mentioned him to keep it. A key is nothing, I said. There may be duplicates, and anyhow, it is not difficult to pick a lock of that kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, while he could watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. I was chilled and unnerved and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and sleepy enough to betray my trust. So altogether I had a dreary and miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned round, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard furthest from the tomb. At the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved but I had to go round the headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over the graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little way off, beyond the line of scattered juniper trees which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by the trees, and I could not see where the figure disappeared. I then heard the rustle of actual movement, where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here? And is it wounded? I then asked. We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. When we had got some little distance away, he went into a clump of trees and struck a match and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time said the professor thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we might have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided we should take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, leave it where he could not fail to find it we would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed the lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment and then went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards and drove to town. I cannot sleep so I make this entry. But I must try to get a few hours sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I shall go with him on another ex September the 27th. It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, 
and the last stragglers of the mooners had taken themselves lazily away when, looking carefully from behind a clump of elder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew then that we were safe till morning, did we desire it. But the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place, and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless. Outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin, to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew from the evidence of our own eyesight that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing has a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again courteously motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but oh, how unutterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over, and again forced back the leaden flange. And then a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Is this a juggle? I said to him. Are you convinced now? said the professor in response, and as he spoke he put over his hand and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips and showed the white teeth. See, he went on, see they are even sharper than before. With this and this, and he touched one of the canine teeth and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John? Once more, argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So, with an attempt to argue, of which I was even at that moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed. That is so. And by whom? I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would not look so. I had no answer for this, and so I was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate, he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids, looking at the eyes, and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here there is one thing which is different from all the recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start. You do not know that, friend John but you shall know it all later. And in trance could he best come to take more blood? In trance she died, and in trance she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when the undead sleep at home, as he spoke, he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home. Their face show what they are, but this so sweet that was when she not undead, she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign there, see, and so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, 
what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? Van Helsing looked at me and evidently saw the change in my face, for he said almost joyously, Ah, you believe now? I answered, Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved, and yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead, as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently he closed the catch of his bag with a snap and said, I have been thinking and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would now at this moment what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are a thousand times more difficult in that them we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time. And to act now would be to take danger from her forever. But then we may have to want Arthur, and how shall we tell him of this? If you, who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospital, if you, who saw the coffin empty last night, and full today with a woman who have not changed only to be morose and beautiful in a whole week after she die, if you know of this, know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, and yet of your own senses you do not believe? How then can I expect Arthur, who know none of these things, to believe? He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me, because in some mistaken idea I have done things that prevent him say goodbye as he ought. And he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive, and that in most mistake of all we have killed her. He will then argue back that it is we, mistaken ones, that have killed her by our ideas, and he will be much unhappy always. Yet he can never be sure, and that is the worst of all. And he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive, and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered. And again he will think that maybe we be right, and that his so beloved was, after all, an undead. No, I told him once, and since then I learn much. Now, since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him. Then we can act for good for all, and send him peace. My mind is made up. Let us go. You return home for tonight to your asylum, and see that all be well. As for me, I shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way. Tomorrow night you will come to me to the Barclay Hotel at ten o'clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall all have work to do. 
I come with you so far as Piccadilly and their dine, for I must be back here before the sun set. So we locked the tomb and came away, got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau, Barclay Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D. September 27th. Friend John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in the churchyard. It pleases me that the undead Miss Lucy shall not leave tonight, that so on the morrow she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix something she like not, garlic, crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead and will heed. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in. For then the undead is desperate and must find the line of least resistance, whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night from sunset till after sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn it. For Miss Lucy or from her, I have no fear. But that other to whom is there that she is undead, he have now the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he have fooled us when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life and we lost. And in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men. Even we four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. So if it be that he come thither on this night, he shall find me. But none other shall, until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead woman sleep and one old man watch. Therefore I write this in case. Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, read them, then find this great undead and cut off his head, burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be so, farewell. Van Helsing Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 28th It is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid before me as outrages on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become unhinged in some way. Surely there must be some rational explanation as to all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I am loath to think it, and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad. But anyhow, I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. September the 29th, morning. Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us what he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur as if all our wills were centred in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him, for he said, there is a grave duty to be done there. You were doubtless surprised at my letter. This query was directed to Lord Godalming. I was, he replied. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble round my house of late that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, 
as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got. Till now I can say for myself that I'm about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. And that's me too, said Quincy Morris laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than friend John here, who has to go a long way back before he can even get so far as to begin. It was evident that he recognized my return to my old doubting frame of mind without my saying a word. Then turning to the other two, he said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore may I ask that you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, although you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be, you shall not blame yourselves for anything. Well, that's frank anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honor of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig in a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honour as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will consider it well and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed, said Arthur. That is only fair. And now that the negotiations are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me and to come in secret to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell as he said in an amazed sort of way, Where poor Lucy is buried. The professor bowed. Arthur went on. And when there? To enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest? Or is this some monstrous joke? Pardon me. I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again, but I could see that he sat firmly and proudly as one who is on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again, And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said angrily, rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this... This desecration of the grave of one who... He fairly choked with indignation. The professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my poor friend, he said, God knows I would. But this night our feet must tread in thorny paths. Or later and forever the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with a set white face and said, Take care, sir. Take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say, said Van Helsing, and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? Uh, that's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause, Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Yes. Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she be not dead, 
Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God, he cried. What do you mean? Has there been some mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften. I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think it. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which age by age they may solve only in part. Believe me, my friend, we are now on the verge of one. But I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur in a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of her dead body. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor, sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonor on her grave? Are you mad that speak such things? Or am I mad that listen to them? Don't dare to think more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do. I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where all the time he had been seated, and said gravely and sternly, My Lord Godalming, I too have a duty to do, a duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen. And if, when later, I make the same request, you do not be more eager for its fulfillment even than I am, then, then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to be. And then, to follow of your lordship's wishes, I shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you when and where you will. His voice then broke a little, and he went on with an accent full of pity. But I do beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me. In a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do, and which sometimes I did wring my heart, I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me that if the time comes for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour, for I would do what a man can to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much of labor, so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can of good, at the first to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady whom too I came to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness. I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins. I gave it, I, who was not like you, her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave to her my nights and days, before death, after death. And if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead, undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride, and Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, It is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand. But at least I will go with you and wait. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark, with occasional gleams of moonlight between the rents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, 
for I feared that the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding tended in some way to counteract his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us, for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to the coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, You were with me here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin? It was. The professor turned to the rest, saying, You hear? And yet there is one who does not believe with me here. He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but he quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Uh, Professor, I answered for you. Now your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago, my friend Seward and I came here, with good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it as now empty. We then waited and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we come here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all the night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had laid over the clamps of those doors garlic, which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus. So tonight, before the sundown, I took away my garlic and other things. And so it is, we find the coffin empty. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Wait you with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So, and here he shut the dark side of the lantern, now to the outside. He opened the door and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by and the brief gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of decay and death. How humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself tolerably patient and half inclined again to throw aside doubt 
and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery with hazard of all that he has to stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, rather like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine, then worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took, and rolling it into thin strips, began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this, and being close, asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb, so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff uh, you've put there going to do it? asked Quincy. Great Scott! Is this a game, my friend? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question came from Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered, The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most sceptical of us, and we felt individually that in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use to him the most sacred of things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of anyone approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress, or yew, or juniper, so seem the embodiment of funereal gloom. Never did trees or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bow creak so mysteriously, and never did the faraway howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, a big aching void. Then, from the professor, a keen shh. He pointed, and far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance. A dim white figure which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell between the masses of driving clouds and showed in startling prominence a dark-haired woman dressed in the sediments of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw was a fair-haired child. There was a pause and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies between the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind the yew tree, kept us back. Then, as we looked, the white figure moved forward again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew as cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but yet, how changed. The sweetness was turned to adamantine heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with flesh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her lawn death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, 
and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I called the thing that was before us Lucy, because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us. Lucy's eyes in form and colour, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hell fire, instead of the pure gentle orbs we knew. At that moment, the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and her face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it. With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child, that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. She still advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace, said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others, and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband. Come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tingling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it, and with a suddenly distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. When within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear burst of moonlight and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's iron nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall such be ever seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful colour became livid. The eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hellfire. The brows were wrinkled as though the folds of flesh were the coils of Medusa snakes, and the lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square as in the passion masks of the Greeks and the Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so for full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, my friend. Am I to proceed in my work? Arthur threw himself on his knees and hid his face in his hands as he answered, Do as you will, friend. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. And he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw, when he stood back, the woman with a corporeal body as real at the moment as our own pass in through the interstice where scarce a knife blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends, we can do no more till tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead 
will all be gone by two, and when the sexton locked the gate, we shall remain. Then there is more to do, but not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harm, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on other night. Then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had sore trial. But Arthur, when you will look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time tomorrow, you will, please God, have passed them and have drunk of the sweet waters. Do not mourn over much. Till then, I shall not ask you. September the 29th Night A little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy Morris, and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that by common consent we had all put on black clothes. Of course Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the churchyard by half-past one, and strolled about, keeping out of official observation, so that when the gravediggers had completed their task, and the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, and as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which when lighted he stuck, by melting their own ends, on other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid of Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the body lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape, but without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you shall see her as she was and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspiritual appearance, seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, in his methodical manner, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron and some plumbing solder, then a small oil lamp which gave out, when lit in a corner of the tomb, gas which burned a fierce heat and a blue flame, then his operating knives which he placed a hand and at last a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire and was sharpened to a fine point. With the stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me a doctor's preparations for work in any kind are stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of law and experience of the ancients and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes with the change the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the praying of the undead, 
become themselves undead and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown into the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know before poor Lucy die, or again last night when you open your arms to her, you would in time, when you had died, have become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would all time make more of those undeads that have so filled us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is just but begun. Those children whose blood she suck are not as yet so much the worse, but if she live on undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her, so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of their throat disappear, they go back to their plays, unknowing ever of what has been. But of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness by night, growing more debased in the assimilation of it by day, she shall take her place with the other angels. So that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing. But is there none amongst us who has a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter in the silence of the night when sleep is not? It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was the hand of him that loved her best the hand that of all she would herself have chosen, had it been to her to choose. Now tell me, tell me if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked to Arthur. He saw too what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled, and his face was as pale as snow, My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage, and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal, be not deceived in that, but it will be only a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take this stake in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart and the hammer in your right. Then, when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled, nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked, I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the open red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth 
champed together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage, so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. Then the writhing and the quivering of the body became less, and the teeth ceased to champ, and the face to quiver, and finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. Great drops of sweat sprang out on his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose too, as he had been seated on the ground, and came and looked. And then a glad, strange light broke over his face, and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There in the coffin lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to it, but Lucy as we had seen her in life with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity. True that there was, as we had seen in life, the traces of care and pain and waste, but these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all, we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder. He said to him, And now, my friend, Arthur, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his, raising it to his lips, pressing it, and saying, Forgiven. God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder, and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently, while we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer she is the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I saw the top of the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off her head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the leaden coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside, the air was sweet, the sun shone, and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves. But there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow, and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task and a difficult, and there is danger in it and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us. Is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes.
and do we not promise to go to the bitter end? Each in turn we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return tomorrow night. Then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what it is to do and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew. For there is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the plowshare, we must not draw back. When we arrived at the Barclay Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. I am coming up by train, Jonathan at Whitby, important news, Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina, he said. Pearl among women. She arrived, but I cannot stay. You must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at station. A telegraph her en route, so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it, he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad and gave me a typewritten copy of it, as also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter on our inquisition. Keep them safe, for there is in them much of treasure. You will need all your faith, even you who have had such an experience as that of today. What is here told, he laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke, may be the beginning of the end to you and me and many other, or it may sound the end of the undead who walk the earth. Read all, I pray you, with an open mind, and if you can add in any way to the story here told so, do, for it is all important. You have kept diary of all these so strange things, is it not so? Yes. Then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure, and shortly after drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms, and I was beginning to feel uneasy lest I might miss my guest, when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me, and after a quick glance said, Dr. Seward, is it not? And you are Mrs. Harker, I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but... And here she suddenly stopped, and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush that rose to my own cheeks somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street, after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting-room and bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a slight shudder when we entered. She told me that, if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So here I am, finishing my entry in my phonograph diary, while I await her. And yet I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. I must get her interested in something, so that I might have the opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is, or what a task we have in hand. I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal, September the 29th. After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with someone. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and on his calling out to come in, I entered. To my intense surprise, 
there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. I hope I did not keep you waiting, I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking, and thought there was someone with you. Oh, he replied with a smile. I was only entering my diary. Your diary? I asked him in surprise. Yes, he answered. I keep it in this. As he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it, and blurted out, Why this beats even shorthand? May I hear it say something? Certainly, he replied with alacrity, and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and a troubled look came over his face. The fact is, he began awkwardly, I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward. That is, I mean... And here he stopped, and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I can know of her, I shall be very grateful. She was very very dear to me. To my surprise, he answered with a horror-struck look in his face, Tell you of her death? Not for the wide world. Why not? I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me. Again he paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length he stammered out, You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary. Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him, and he said with unconscious simplicity, in a different voice, and with the naivety of a child, That's quite true. Upon my honour, honest Indian. I could not but smile, at which he grimaced. I gave myself away that time, he said. But do you know, that although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it? in case I wanted to look it up. By this time, my mind was made up that the diary of a doctor who attended Lucy might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge of that terrible being. And I said boldly, Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter. He grew to a positively deathly pallor and said, No, no, no. For all the world, I wouldn't let you know that terrible story. Then it was terrible. My intuition was right. For a moment I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room, unconsciously looking for something or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on the great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and without his thinking, followed their direction. As they saw the parcel, he realized my meaning. You do not know me, I said. When you have read those papers, my own diary and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. I have not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this cause, but of course you do not know me yet, and I must not expect you to trust me so far. He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him. He stood up and opened a large drawer in which were arranged in order a number of hollow cylinders of metal covered with dark wax, and said, You are quite right. I did not trust you because I did not know you. But I know you now. And let me say that I should have known you long ago. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders and hear them. The first half dozen of them are personal to me, and they will not horrify you, and then you will know me better. Dinner will by then be ready. In the meantime, I shall read over some of these documents, and shall be better able to understand certain things. He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting room and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode, of which I know one side already.
Dr. Seward's diary, September the 29th. I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker and that other of his wife that I let the time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, She is possibly tired. Let dinner wait an hour. And I went on with my work. I had just finished Mrs. Harker's diary when she came in. She looked sweetly pretty, but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late I have had cause for tears, God knows, but the relief of them was denied me. And now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened with recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said to her as gently as I could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh, no, not distressed me, she replied. But I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. That is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me in its very tones the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words on my typewriter, and none other need now hear your heartbeat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know, I said in a low voice. She then laid her hand on mine and said very gravely, Ah, but they must. Must? But why? I asked. Because it is part of the terrible story. A part of poor dear Lucy's death and all that led to it. Because in the struggle which we have before us to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help which we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contain more than you intended me to know. But I can see that there is in your record many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? I know all up to a certain point, and I see already, though your diary only took me to September the 7th, how poor Lucy was beset, and how her terrible doom was being wrought out. Jonathan and I have been working day and night since Professor Van Helsing saw us. He has gone to Whitby to get more information, and will be here tomorrow to help us. We need have no secrets amongst us. Working together and with absolute trust, we can surely be stronger than if some of us are in the dark. She looked at me so appealingly, and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearings, that I gave in at once to her wishes. You shall, I said, do as you like in the matter. God forgive me if I do wrong. There are terrible things yet to learn of, but if you have so far travelled on the road to poor Lucy's death, you will not be content, I know, to remain in the dark. Nay, the end, the very end, may give you a gleam of peace. Come, there is dinner. We must keep one another strong for what is before us. We have a cruel and dreadful task. When you have eaten, you shall learn the rest, and I will answer any questions you ask, if there be anything which you do not understand, though it was apparent to us who were present. Mina Harker's Journal, September the 29th. After dinner, I came with Dr. Seward to his study. He brought back the phonograph from my room, and I took my typewriter. He placed me in a comfortable chair, and arranged the phonograph so that I could touch it without getting up, and showed me how to stop it in case I should want to pause. Then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me, so that I might be as free as possible, and began to read. I put the forked metal to my ears, and listened. When the terrible story of Lucy's death, and all that followed, was done, I laid back in my chair powerless. Fortunately, I am not of a fainting disposition. When Dr. Seward saw me, he jumped up with a horrified exclamation, and hurriedly taking a case bottle from a cupboard, gave me some brandy, which in a few minutes somewhat restored me. My brain was all in a whirl, and only that there came through all the multitude of horrors the holy ray of light, that my dear, dear Lucy was at last at peace, I do not think I could have borne it without making a scene. It is all so wild and mysterious and strange 
that if I had not known Jonathan's experience in Transylvania, I could not have believed it. As it was, I didn't know what to believe, and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, Let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan to come on here when he arrives in London from Whitby. In this matter, dates are everything, and I think if we get all our material ready and have every item put in chronological order, we shall have done much. You tell me that Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris are coming too. Let us be able to tell them when they come. He accordingly set the phonograph at a slow pace, and I began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventh cylinder. I used manifold, and so took three copies of the diary, just as I had done with all the rest. It was late when I got through, but Dr. Seward went about his work of going his round of the patients. When he had finished, he came back and sat near me reading, so I did not feel too lonely whilst I worked. How good and thoughtful he is. The world seems full of good men, even if there are monsters in it. Before I left him, I remembered what Jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station at Exeter. So, seeing that Dr. Seward kept his newspapers, I borrowed the files of the Westminster Gazette and the Pall Mall Gazette and took them to my room. I remembered how much the Daily Graph and the Whitby Gazette, of which I had made cuttings, helped me to understand the terrible events at Whitby when Count Dracula landed. So I shall look through these papers and then perhaps get some new light. I am not sleepy, and the work will help to keep me quiet. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 30th. Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He had got his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If his journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account of it, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet, business-like gentleman who came here today. Later. After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says they are knitting together in chronological order every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consignee of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's typescript of my diary. I wonder what they will make of it. Here he is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the typescript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Stop. That way madness lies. Harker has gone back and is again collating his material. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show a whole connective narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield, as hitherto he has been a sort of index as to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this as yet, but when I get at the dates I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker has put my cylinders into type. We should never have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment he seems as sane as anyone I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned to my knowledge during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that had I not had the chat with Harker, read the letter and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? 
Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay. He is himself zoophagus, and in his wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house he always spoke of master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away. My friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then... So I came away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his. So I have given the attendant a hint to look closely after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's Journal, September the 29th, in train to London. When I received Mr. Billington's courteous message that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make on the spot such inquiries as I wanted. It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Counts to its place in London. Later we may be able to deal with it. Billington, Jr., a nice lad, met me at the station and brought me to his father's house, where they had decided I must stay the night. They are hospitable with true Yorkshire hospitality, give a guest everything and leave him free to do as he likes. They all knew that I was busy and that my stay was short, and Mr. Billington had ready in his office all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes. It gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which I had seen on the Count's table before I knew of his diabolical plans. Everything had been carefully thought out and done systematically and with precision. He seems to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out. To use an Americanism, he had taken no chances and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care. I saw the invoice and took note of it. Fifty cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes. Also the copy of letter to Carter Patterson and their reply. Of both of these I got copies. This was all the information Mr. Billington could give me, so I went down to the port and saw the coast guards the custom officers, and the harbour master. They all had something to say for the strange entry of the ship, which is already taking its place in local tradition, but no one could add simply to the description, fifty cases of common earth. I then saw the station master, who kindly put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes. Their tally was exact with the list, and they had nothing to add except that the boxes were main and mortal heavy, and that shifting them was dry work. One of them added that it was hard lines that there wasn't any gentleman, such as like yourself, squire, to show some sort of appreciation of their efforts in a liquid form. Another put in a rider that the thirst then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it. September the 30th. The stationmaster was good enough to give me a line to his old companion, the stationmaster at King's Cross, so that when I arrived there in the morning I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He too put me at once in communication with the proper officials, and I saw that their tally was correct with the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had been here limited. A noble use of them had, however, been made, and again I was compelled to deal with the result in an ex post facto manner. From thence I went on to Carter Patterson's central office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transactions in their day book and letter book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune, the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over, sending also by one of them the way bill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes to Carfax. Here again I found the tally agreeing exactly the carrier's men able to supplement the paucity of the written details with a few words. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job and of the consequent thirst engendered in the operators. On my affording an opportunity, through the medium of the currency of the realm, of the allaying, at a later period, this beneficent evil, one of the men remarked, Oh, that here house, Governor, it's the rummiest I ever was in. 
Blimey! He ain't been touched since hundred years. There was dust that thick in the place. You might have slept on it without hurting your bones. And the place was that neglected. You might have smelled old Jerusalem in it. Oh, but the old chapel. That took the cake, that did. Me and me mate, we thought we would not never get out there quick enough. Law! I wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there after dark. Having been in the house, I could well believe him. But if he knew what I know, he would, I think, have raised his terms. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr. Seward's diary, I fear. I shall try to see the carter who took away the boxes from Carfax when Renfield attacked them. By following up this clue, we may learn a good deal. Later, Mina and I have worked all day and put all our papers in order. Mina Harker's Journal, September the 30th. I am so glad I hardly know how to contain myself. It is, I suppose, the reaction from the haunting fear which I have had, that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on Jonathan. I saw him leave for Whitby with as brave a face as I could, but I was sick with apprehension. The effort, however, has done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. It is just as that dear good Professor Van Helsing said. He is true grit, and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life and hope and determination. We have got everything in order for tonight. I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the Count. That is just it. The thing is not human, not even beast. To read Dr. Seward's account of poor Lucy's death and what followed is enough to dry up the springs of pity in anyone's heart. Later, Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting for it brought back all poor Lucy's dear hopes of only a few months ago. Of course they had heard Lucy speak of me, and it seemed that Dr. Helsing too had been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows, neither of them is aware that I know all about the proposals that they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to say or do, as they were ignorant as to the amount of my knowledge, so they had to keep on neutral subjects. However, I thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them in affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death, and that I need not fear to betray any secrets before them. So I told them, as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries, and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I gave them each a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got his, he turned it over. It does make a pretty good pile. And he said, Did you write all this, Mrs. Harker? I nodded, and he went on, I don't quite see the drift of it. But you people are all so good and kind, and have been working so earnestly and so energetically, that all I can do is accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you love my poor Lucy. At this point he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. 
I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards, he will never have such a feeling. But there I wrong him. I know he never will. He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking, I love dear Lucy, and I know what she was to you and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters. And now she is gone, will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you have had, though I cannot measure the depth of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service to you, for Lucy's sake? In an instant the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief. It seemed to me that all he had been of late suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical, and raising his open hands, beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief. He stood up, then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob he laid his head on my shoulder, and cried like a weary child, whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters when the mother spirit is invoked. I felt this big, sorrowing man's head resting on me as though it were that of the baby that some day may lie on my bosom, and I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sobs ceased, and he raised himself with an apology though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for days and nights past, weary days, sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with anyone, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstances with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. I know now how I have suffered he said as he dried his eyes. But I do not know even yet, and none other can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy has been to me today. I shall know better in time, and believe me that, though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake? For dear Lucy's sake. I said, and we clasped hands. I and for your own sake, he added, for if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine today. If ever the future should bring you to a time when you need a man's help, believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, Promise me that you will let me know. He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh, that I felt it would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr. Morris looking out of a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. How is art? he said. Then he noticed my red eyes and went on, Ah, I see you've been comforting him. Poor old fellow, he needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he's in trouble of the heart, and he's had no one to comfort him. He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it he would realize how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend? And will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later on why I speak so. He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping, took my hand, raised it to his lips, and kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. But he said quite calmly, Little girl, you will never regret that true kind-heartedness, 
so long as ever you live. Then he went into the study to his friend. Little girl, the very words he had used to Lucy, and oh, but he proved himself a friend. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 30th. I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived but had already studied the transcript of the various diaries and letters which Harker and his wonderful wife had made and arranged. Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea and I can honestly say that for the first time since I have lived in it, the old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see your patient Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty I could not refuse her and there was no possible reason why I should. So I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in by all means, but just a minute till I tidy the place up. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of the bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been before the attack in my own study, and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities that mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged in doubt, and then, to my intense astonishment, he said, "'You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? "'You can't be, you know, for she's dead.' Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh, no, I have a husband of my own to whom I am married before I ever saw Dr. Seward or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. Then what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then don't stay. But why not? I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker, any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? I said. His reply was simply contemptuous, given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, and then instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question, he said. I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the errors of non causae and ignoratio elenchi. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. 
Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I ever met with, talking elemental philosophy with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory. If this new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift of power. We continued to talk for some time, and seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began, to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity and that by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I actually tried to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out on one occasion that I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life. Though, indeed, the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarized the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, Doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what I ought to think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker it was time to leave. She came at once, after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, Goodbye. I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray, God, I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seems more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self again than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once, and rushed up to me, saying, Ah, friend John, how goes all? Well, ah, so I have been busy for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madame Mina is with you, yes, and her so fine husband, and Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too. Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! She has man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After tonight, she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she runs so great a risk. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman. Even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer both in waking from her nerves and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is young woman and not so long married. There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me that she wrote all. Well, then she must consult with us. But tomorrow she say goodbye to this work, and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence. 
that the house which Dracula had brought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come over him. Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy's life. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into a silence that lasted till we entered our own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Uh, not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, uh, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? We have seen hitherto how good light all the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worse for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from her pocket, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this? and tell me if it must go in. It is my record of today. I too have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial, but there is little in it except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, but pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more, and all of us, your friends, more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush and a bright smile. And so now, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything. So when we all meet in the study, we shall all be informed as to facts and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Nina Harker's Journal, September the 30th. When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next the professor and Dr. Seward in the centre. The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. We all expressed assent, and then he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me. So then we can discuss how we shall act, and can take our measures according. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at first I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear, See, see, I prove, I prove. Alas, had I known at first what now I know, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must so work that other poor souls perish not whilst we can say. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. This vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, for his cunning be the growth of ages. 
he have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his entomology imply, the divination by the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute, he is devil in callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within limitations, appear at will, when and where, and in any of the forms that are to him. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat, the owl, the bat, the moth, the fox, and the wolf. He can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How then are we to begin our strife to destroy him? How shall we find him where? And having found, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win. And then, where end we? Life is nothings. I heed him not. But to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him. That we henceforth become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those who love best. To us, Forever are the gates of heaven shut. For who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time, abhorred by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the sight of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case must not shrink. For me, I say no, but then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his song of birds, his music, and his love, life are behind. You others are young. Some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. Well, what say you? Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked in my eyes and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself, he said. Count me in, Professor, said Mr. Quincy Morris laconically, as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr. Seward simply nodded. The Professor stood up, and after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand, and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right hand with his left, and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So, as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely, and in as businesslike a way, as any other transaction of life. Well, you know what we have to contend against. But we too are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have resources of science, we are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in a cause and an end to achieve, which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. 
In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go on are traditions and superstitions. These do not at first appear much, when the matter is one of life and death, nay of more than either life or death. Yet must we be satisfied. In the first place, because we have to be, no other means is at our control, and secondly, because after all these things, tradition, superstition, are everything. A year ago, my friends, which of us would have received such a possibility in the midst of our scientific, skeptical, matter-of-fact 19th century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it then that the vampire and the belief in his limitations and his cure rest for the moment on the same base. For let me tell you, my friends, he is known everywhere that men have been, in old Greece, in old Rome. He flourished in Germany all over, in France, in India, even in the Cherasanese. And in China, so far from us in all ways, there even is he, and the peoples fear him to this day. We have followed the wake of the berserk Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon. And let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he fatten on the blood of the living. Even more we have seen amongst us that he can even grow younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous and seem as though they refresh themselves when his own special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, never did see him to eat, never. He throw no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observed. He has the strength of many in his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby when he tear open the dog. He can be as bat as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create. That noble ship's captain proved him of this. But from what we know, the distance he can make the mist is limited and can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw the sisters in the castle of Dracula. He becomes so small. We ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hair's breadth space at the tomb door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound or even fused up with fire, so that you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me through, my friends. He can do all these things, and yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why? We know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be someone of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, 
he can only change himself at noon or at exact sunrise or sunset. These things are we told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed, as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still at other time he can only change when the time come. It is said too that he can only pass running water at the slack or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve, and to them he is nothing. But in their presence he take his place far off, and silent with respect. There are others too. I shall tell you of them, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he may not move from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him so that he be through dead, and as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen that with our eyes. Thus, my friends, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius of Budapest University to make his record, and from all the means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must indeed have been that Vovoide Dracula, who won his name against the Turk over the great river on the very frontier of Turkey land. And if it be so, then he was no common man. For in that time and for centuries after he was spoken of as the cleverest and most cunning as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and they are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race though now and again were scions who were held by their coevals to have had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Sholomans among the mountains over Lake Hermstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Stregoika, Witch, Ordog and Pokol, Satan and Hell, and in one manuscript This very Dracula is spoken of as Wampire, which we all understand only too well. There have been, my friends, from the loins of this very one great men and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In soil barren of holy memories, It cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window. He now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. Now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look today, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must dress. At this point we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which ricocheting from the top of the embrasure struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did this, we heard Mr. Morris's voice without, saying, Oh, I'm sorry. I fear I've alarmed you. 
I shall come in and tell you all about it. A minute later he came in and said, It was an idiotic thing for me to do, and I ask your pardon. I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that while the professor was talking, there came a big bat and sat on the window sill. I've got such a horror of the damn brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, so I went out to have a shot, as I've been doing of late evenings whenever I've seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art. And did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. Well, I don't know. I, I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair, or we must, so to speak, sterilize the earth so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madam Mina, this night is the end until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men and are able to bear. But you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in the danger such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seem relieved. But it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow. I could say nothing save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there's no time to lose, I vote we have a look at the house right now. Tom is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their councils altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax with means to get into the house. Manlike, they have told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to rest, lest Jonathan have some added anxiety about me. Dr. Seward's diary. October the 1st, 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know, but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without cause, so I said, All right, I'll go now. And I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to see a patient. Take me with you, friend John, said the professor. His case in your diary interested me much, and it has bearing too now and again on our case. I should much like to see him, and especially when his mind is disturbed. May I come also? asked Lord Godalming. Me too, said Quincy Morris. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever met with in a lunatic and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with others entirely sane. We all four went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and adduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. 
they will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming. I had the honour of seconding your father at Wyndham. I grieve to know by your holding the title that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, the much patronised on Derby night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter when the Pole and the Tropics may hold allegiance to the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place as a political fable. What shall any man say to his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionized therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world, I take to witness that I am as sane as the least of the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. And I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian, medical jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes this did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, my dear sir, and in our implied agreement with the old scytheman, it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish to ensure its fulfilment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others and scrutinized them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on, Is it possible that I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly but at the same time as I felt brutally. There was a considerable pause. Then, he said slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, boon, privilege, what you will. I am content to employ in such a case not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, sound and unselfish, and springing from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, my dear sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another form or phase of his madness, 
and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of the utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as one addressing an equal, Can you not tell me frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger without prejudice and with the habit of keeping an open mind, Dr. Seward will give you at his own risk and on his own responsibility the privilege you seek. Renfield shook his head sadly and with a look of poignant regret on his face. The professor went on. Oh, come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise, help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. But I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over my patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was militating against him by restoring us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes. So I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same, constantly growing excitement in him, when he had to make some request of which at the time he had thought much of, as such, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. The expectation I had of a collapse was not realised, for when my patient found his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication and pouring forth a torrent of entreaty. The tears were rolling down his cheeks, and his whole face and form were expressive of the deepest emotion. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once, he said. Send me away how you will and where you will. Send keepers with me with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled, leg-ironed, even to a jail, but let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I'm speaking from the depth of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this, save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now? That I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul? Oh, hear me! Hear me! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. 
So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind later on that I did what I could to convince you tonight. Jonathan Harker's Journal, October the 1st, 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I am so glad she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all. But now that her work is done, and that it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells, she may well feel that her part is finished, and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were all silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, Say, Jack! If that man wasn't attempting a bluff, well, he's about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. I'm not sure, but I believe he had some serious purpose. And if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to give him a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent, but Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more of lunatics than I do, and I'm glad of it, for I fear if it had been to me to decide... I would, before that last hysterical outburst, have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance, as my friend Quincy would say. All is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know but that I agree with you, he said. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him but he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy kind of way that I am afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fervor for a cat and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and the rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't about trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things, in conjunction with the work we have in hand, do help to unnerve a man. The professor then stepped over, and laying a hand on his shoulder, said in his grave, kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case. We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for, except the pity of the good Lord? Lord Godalming has slipped away for a few minutes, but he had now returned. He held up a little silver whistle as he remarked, That old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight came out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kind. Our enemy is not merely spiritual, Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable, his is not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man, or a body of men more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him. 
but yet they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers around your neck, and here he handed to me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife. And for aid in all, these so small electric lamps, which you can fasten to your breast. And for all, and above all at the last, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of the sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If so, we can open the door, and we need not break by the window as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit. After a little play back and forward, the bolt then yielded, and with a rusty clang shot back. We pressed on the door. The rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Miss Westerner's tomb. I fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. The professor was the first to move forward, and he stepped into the open door. In manus tuas domine, he said, crossing himself as he passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we might possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, in case we might not be able to open it from within, she would be in a hurry to make our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded to our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms as the rays crossed each other or the opacity of our bodies through great shadows. I could not for the life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection, so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings, of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps. I was holding down my lamp, and I could see the marks of hobnails where the dust was caked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spiders' webs, whereon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down. On a table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time yellow label on each. They had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, like that exposed when the professor lifted the keys. He turned to me and said, you know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel? I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it. So I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low arched oaken door ribbed with iron bands. This is the spot, said the professor, as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps. But none of us expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters and when I had seen him, he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or when he was glutted with fresh blood, in a ruin building open to the air. But here the place was small and close, and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, 
as of some dry miasma which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality and with the pungent, acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. It sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances, such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end. But this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, The first thing to see is how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright, for seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the highlights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry. I then turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding place even for him. I took it that fear had helped my imagination, and said nothing. A few minutes later, I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door, which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute, three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously, we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved, I noticed the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way. But even in the minute that had elapsed, the number of the rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm all over the place all at once, till the lamplight shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes, made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, then simultaneously, lifting their noses, began to howl in the most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands and moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs and, carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground, he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had by now been lifted in in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going, it seems as if some evil presence had departed, 
for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes and turned them over and over, tossing them in the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise. Whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open, I know not. But most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door, barred and locked it, bringing the dogs with us, and then began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout, except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched, save for my own footsteps when I had first made my visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel, they frisked about as though they had been rabbit hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken the key off the hall door from the bunch, and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. So far, he said, our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us, such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first, and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous step, has been accomplished without the bringing thereinto our most sweet, Madam Mina, or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson, too, we have learned, if it be allowable to argue a particulari, that the brute beasts which are to the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For look, these rats that would come to his call just as from his castle top he summoned the wolves to your going, and to that poor mother's cry, though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the sole little dogs of my friend Arthur. Well, we have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears, and that monster, he has not used his power over the brute world for the only or the last time tonight. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us opportunity to cry check in some way to this chess game which we play for the stake of human souls. And now, my friends, let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our first night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril, but we must go on and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards, and a low moaning sound from Renfield's room. The poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane, with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into my own room and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it, she looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad it is all settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforward our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at such time come as we can tell her that all is finished, and that the earth is free from a monster of the nether world. I dare say it will be difficult to begin to keep silence after such a confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and tomorrow I shall keep dark over tonight's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa, 